trading is about knowing the field. Foreseeing the opportunity. Executing at the right moment. Timing is everything. Hello Dream Team and a very warm welcome to another episode of The Good, The Bad and The Rugby in partnership with City Index, the leading provider of spread betting, CFD and FX trading. James Haskell is here. Mike Tindall is here. <laughs> and the new <laughs> oh, Centurion. No, the... Centurion for English rugby is, here, is not here. Oh, this yeah. I yeah. thought you meant... And the new uh, uh, heavyweight the new champion heavyweight of Wandsworth. Champ Look at that. We were, in that was a the very, pretty tight waist. Do you know what? A lot of, so many people are invested in this. And when I said to me, you won. You're going to have to like, describe because we're a podcast. Okay, sorry. No, we're actually a visual medium as well. I'm holding up an incredible belt. <laughs> uh, the Jackson Swiss Partners, the war in Wandsworth belt between Archie Curzon and Alex Payne. Um, and Alex Payne won on a three-round thriller at the Wandsworth Town Hall. Um, first round, Alex won comfortably. Second round, I would decide I got filled in. <laughs> I reckon I was one punch away from having the, the, the fight stopped. Yeah, yeah. I, we thought you were as well, because when you slumped into the ropes, yeah. like, oh God. And then I never forget seeing you go into the corner. I mean, you might want to talk about it yourself in terms of what you what you were experiencing. But kind of that that moment where I saw you so tired that you were too like bumbling in. It's like bumbling into each other, <laughs> falling into the ropes, out on your legs, you know. Hands are so tired, just happy to get punched. And he went into the corner and there was a lot of soul searching. I mean, what, what was going on in there? So I had the brilliant Bill out in my corner who stepped in late on because the fight was a little bit in jeopardy due to one or two injuries. But he stepped in and in the, at the end of the second, my head was basically falling off. I was bleeding through my nose. And he said, it's one one in rounds. It now comes down to who wants it the most. He said, do you want it? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, do you want it? I said, no, I really don't. And he said, you're going to have to find it. Go find it. He said, give me a big first 25 seconds and see what happens. And so I went, <gasps> reinflated, came out. Yeah, that, that was the most tired you've ever been. I, I have never, ever, ever been in a pit that deep. <laughs> I would have paid a lot of money to have got out of the ring at the end of that second round. <laughs> I was, uh, I, I just felt you didn't really hide your tightness that well. Mate, I couldn't hide anything. Between rounds, you basically slumped over the ropes. I'm 40 <laughs> fucking two. I'm a middle-aged man with two young kids and yeah. working with two idiots like you. I don't expect to get in the ring. I mean, I have never, ever, ever done anything like it. It was no. the most extraordinary kaleidoscopic experience in terms of the run-in, the fear, the nerves, the anxiety. Because you were much more anxious you let on. Because you know why? Because every yeah. time I asked you, or we asked you, how are you doing? You did the typical thing, like, I'm fine, I'm fine. looking forward yeah. to it. <laughs> Everyone else said, I spoke to Alex, he's like shitting himself. Yeah. He's like nervous, he just can't, he's not sleeping. And I was like, well, he's not told us that. He said he's absolutely well, fine. Listen, you may have won a World Cup and you may have won a Grand Slam, but none of you have stepped into the ring. <laughs> this is very true. Manor, this is <laughs> very true. For it. It You've is... had more fights than my professional fighting career. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as I said to Archie afterwards, I said, one, one and done. I ain't ever getting in a ring ever again. Yeah. But it was a good night. I owe an enormous gratitude thanks to you two because you did a brilliant <laughs> auction. You're just an absolute ledge. You were my henchman. You were sort of quite, quite laughy as my henchman. Which oh, I was, I was dead serious. No, no, we I were was laughing. pushing people out of the way. I was yeah, pushing, was pushing actually the fact that the, everyone in salmon trousers was getting in the way. I was like, yeah. get out of yeah. the fucking yeah. way with you, lads. It, like, is a, it is an extraordinary thing yeah. to do. But it got me so fired up. No, I was laughing beforehand <laughs> at Archie's kind of cash, you know, the, the song, um, I don't know what his walking song was, but you know, the money, money, or whatever it was, yeah. And it was this whole video thing. And I was pissed myself, then got really serious. And then some nausea bloke came up to me while I was facing the other way, just like in the zone. But so, uh, I haven't given Payne no a chance. Can he win? And after about five minutes, I went, mate, will you fuck off? And we're not, yeah, just leave me alone. I'm in, uh, I'm in the zone here. I'm waiting well, for you. You gave me a good pep talk. Yeah, what, I gave you I gave it. There were a lot of people see behind closed doors. Would a, uh, would a night not be complete without you having to say, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck off and yeah. leave me alone? I was, yeah. I mean, but I tell you, it was interesting because I, I, Alex obviously, always been a commentator or a 
spe- spectator on a big sporting event, but this was the first time he actually was the event and got to experience the adulation of walking through the crowd, the buzz, the vibe. So, uh, you, yeah, so you yeah. Call, he called me in before and I gave him, I got into like full captain mode, like chat mode. I loved it. Probably none of which he, uh, you remember now. I remember yeah. bits. Is it flat, yeah. I just flashy? Really, yeah, it was you, quite flashy. Yeah. Is it someone, so I had lunch with someone who was a, a big, he's like a, pro, uh, a proper boxing fan and used to do stuff at, and he was like, has he ever fought before? And I was like, no. And he was like, right, it'll turn into a windmill fest because yeah. he won't know how to deal with the flood of adrenaline when he first gets hit. Do you Did know, you it find that? No, it wasn't that. But there is no greater truism than Mike Tyson's everybody's got a plan until they get hit in the face. So I had trained, I'm a Southpaw, and I hadn't told him that, which is my one advantage. I was eight years old, so I was going to cling on to everything I had. <laughs> yeah. I was really prepped to be I was very relaxed I was going to be very very jab get out jab get out I, my movement in the training was really good and I thought I'm just going to keep out of danger um, I've got a longer reach everybody said don't blow up in the first round all my concentration was just on just fighting the fight that I'd prepped for yeah. five seconds in he comes burrowing over like a sort of whirling dervish just smacks oh, oh, left right left right and I'm like oh my god this is the dance we're going to do <laughs> and he, he actually hit me incredibly hard in the stomach, which I hadn't, I hadn't had as prep, and I was like, <gasps> and I was like, oh my god, what happens now? Do I survive? Do I carry on? And you just end up. It just, I mean, it was a bar and brawl in the end, but it was quite a good bar and brawl. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, we've raised an enormous amount of money, which is the only reason for doing it. Um, I'll never ever ever. And it was so it was very per- obviously, you know, very personal to you with the, the brain tumor trust, and obviously, I go into details. There was obviously people in the crowd within who, yeah. in tears, and I think it meant so much life. to them to. To do it, and I think it was emotional in in every a- aspect. You know, pre kind of getting everyone hyped up, then the doors opened, and you know, all the guys from our team at GBR came down, yeah. friends and family. Zeb was there, Chloe was there. Um, I think and your, your whole family was there. Your missus was there, not knowing what to kind of expect. She did not enjoy no, it. but I thought I think it was utterly amazing, and I think you should be very proud of what you were. Uh... You also had to deal with the fact that you said in the <laughs> the math fight before oh God, yeah. got battered, and he was sharing a a, a uh, cupboard with you. Yeah. So he comes back in yeah. after the fight being stopped, and someone thrown Bloody in the and towel. Bowed. He came perfect in... for your confidence builder. That he'd one, literally it? been folded like a deck table. We were, we were changing in a two by two meter room. So when while he was warming up, I was sitting on a chair in my pants trying quite hard not to get hit by his warm-up he went out I got dressed got ready did a bit of pad work he came back in four minutes later bleeding his his corner throwing the towel in as you say he was absolutely all over the place and I was like my turn yeah and it was it's really like um like the noise back there it was it was quite sort of visceral is the only word I can describe and I've only ever been to I went to um George Groves Carl Froch at Wembley years ago and that was feisty though. yeah that, that was, was a feisty mega. fight and it was it was just an unbelievable um, sort of experience to walk into, and yeah, I, I'm so pleased it's done. And, and look, a fair play to Archie, you know, obviously he was put, brilliant. putting the he night on brilliant. and event yeah. on, and actually it was amazing. <laughs> it's amazing to meet some of our some of the Clapham Falcons fans yeah. <laughs> who still haven't quite grasped that he's taken the piss out of them which or is I, he or is he or yeah. is he not yeah um, which was quite amazing I mean there was a lot there was a lot of posh people in that room by the way yeah. mainly what, s- what some of your relatives and some of his relatives <laughs> it, was very, it was very interesting they bid very generously on the auction yes, but how did. good was they made um, you look very good they did make you look very good um, how good was um, the commentator Adam Smith uh, Adam Smith so I was going to say I was going to thank, thank you two I was going to thank Simon Thomas who was our Michael Buffer yeah. and was absolutely brilliant. he was fantastic but to fight with Adam Smith, who is the voice of boxing, and Matt Macklin, who has been there and done it. And I mean, there were various bits where I was getting filled in and I could just, I could just hear he's Adam hear saying, them. he's on the ropes, he's yeah. going down, he's going in. And I was <laughs> and just like, not his now, feet Adam. again. <laughs> not yeah. now. And I've worked with him for years and years and years. I'm in, incredibly indebted to both of them, but it just sort of elevated yeah, it did. It made the it, whole it, thing. It basically, because it was essentially an as de brawl, like in, yeah. a, in <laughs> yeah. a thing, they made it, uh, I'd say, a Waitrose session because yeah. it, it could have been, you yeah. know, if you'd had someone like me commentating on it, it could have been terrible. And he was brilliant. <laughs> he, yeah, he, was very he had the je ne sais quoi that was, yeah. he salt bayed the entire yeah. he was event. Gl- he was glitter on a turn. He was yeah. glitter on a turn. He, he was, yeah, he um, rolled you sufficiently in a pile of glitter. I did want to say chapeau to Arch as well I've got maximum respect somebody sent me a really nice email in the build up just saying the glory is in the getting in the ring it's not in the in the outcome yeah. and that is 
I think, yeah. a real truism about what, boxing. Framboise Waddle Dudley was there as well. Yeah, he was there. On trying a stag to dress too. down. He yeah. wasn't in a gilet or tweed. No. He was half naked in the in the ring at 1 a.m. as everyone else was going home. Oh, so really? Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's disgraced himself, is he? Well, not for the first time. <laughs> yeah, amazing. It was very good to see him there. Um, thank you. I was also, who else? Yes, yeah, so we raised a lot of money for Restart Rugby and for the Brain Tuber charity. If you'd like to pop a pound in the pot, that would be amazing. The video is up on Vimeo yeah. if you'd oh, like you to watch it. Or you can pop three entire, pounds in the, in the, in the and pot watch and watch the entirety. whole thing. Yeah, I think you can find it on Vimeo via socials. I think it's on my link tree. It'll be on so mine in a minute as yeah, well. It's on house as well. Um, that wasn't terribly glorious sport. It was a lot of fun. I'm very glad it's over. Talking of glorious and the glory, Skaz 100. Yeah. yeah, amazing. I mean, you were there. I was there. I'm gonna okay. So I've attended a lot of rugby games in my in my time. I mean, firstly, Welford Road. I haven't been there for years. What a stadium and setup that is now over there. Glorious sunshine. Fifteen over fifteen thousand people in the crowd, right? Which obviously had a record uh, last week. They've dealt with, but they've beaten it this week. And my experience of going to a women's rugby game was utterly glorious. I didn't get nosed once by any, you know, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you what, there was only two weird comments, which normally there's a hundred, and that was by two men out of the sea of women, and one bloke was like, can you sign my daughter's um, program? And I did, he went, well, you really are a media whore, aren't you? And then just sort of walked off, and I was like, wow, <laughs> wow, mate, wow. Um, but everyone, but Run up, get the program, set it on fire. <laughs> yeah. But they were, do you know what? Everyone was so friendly, so kind, so into it. Even I walked past a group of girls and they were like, you could do with some glitter. And I was like, I, you know what, I, I actually could. They glittered me up with red on one cheek, silver on the other. The game was was uh, uh, really interesting because I thought, um, I mean, ultimately England won by quite a margin. But for the first half, they were held to 10 points. Ireland you know, caused a lot of problems at the breakdown. Um, and, and actually discipline for England wasn't great. And I, I imagine Simon Middleton probably had a few words at, at half time. And I think they've got France um, next week in six day turnaround Grand Slam to Grand Slam yeah, and if they don't get that right if they don't start well in Bayonne but, probably be another record crowd yeah but, I mean how good is that so yeah. good I but, mean 14,600 15,700 yeah. and then I don't know what actually Bayonne holds actually but um but the atmosphere, yeah. you know, they had all these, they had all these. I don't know which teams they were, but they had seemed to have a load of um, women players all in their caps from the south and the west, all singing in the stands. It's just it was a completely different vibe than anything. And it was kind of like I imagine rugby was kind of fifteen years ago, where it was kind of really just fun. A lot of kids there and Skaz. I mean, you know, a she got to run out with hundred with Leah and Infante and run out and both get to celebrate that kind of moment and then the glory. And, and then do you know what the nicest thing about it at the end of the game was her mum and dad were there. I met. Mr. and Mrs. Scarrett, she, they were lovely. And do you know what the interesting thing about their relationship is? The dad's the, the big emotional one, which, you know, we're not signing for gender a farmer, roles. For a, for, yeah, a farmer, that's not... for a farmer, but he was emotional. He, he could struggling to keep it together and was a real blubber. <laughs> and so Emily was like winding him up. But you no, know, for, for him to be able to award her the 100 cap or the parents to award the 100 cap, she to be held aloft all the kids in the audience, because she really is a superstar, shouting, Emily, Emily, um, you know, and I, what I loved about the girls is, of uh, the women's team, every single one of them stayed out yeah. and made sure everything was was signed. And all around, it was just a great day and for a great player who thoroughly deserves it. And I, you know, I, I we were doing TikTok for O2 Inside Line and, um, you know, you can just see how, why this game's so exciting. England are shining, like England are leading in everything they do, but they're doing everything right and I, I couldn't be more of a fan, really. Good on this, Gaz. I think she's growing into the fact that the pod is now named after her as well. Yeah, she is finding she, her way. But yeah. she had. I mean, I got to kept the little program like a keynote. Good. Did you get to it. sign it? I, I didn't get to Elma, sign it. Elma's got a sign. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe she likes. I, w- I would. I would say on on things about moving forward. I think we do have to bring up that that. The program is like one of Hass Buffs. <laughs> <laughs> Waffer thin. <laughs> I got no I real content. If you, anyone who's been to. The the men's game there is a it's a proper chunky book with yeah. proper stories in there. I mean we you know anything that the good the scares the rugby will open you up is how many characters there are there are in women's rugby. Maybe they should try and explore some of them in their in their programs. Yeah. Um- it was a brilliant day for Skaz. And actually, it was some really lovely content with you, Elmer, Skaz at the end. And it just sort of, I don't know, in 2022, where the world is melting, I just really enjoy what those yeah. two are doing. But yeah, I think. And with Mo th- Hunt involved as well, it's just 
Just but I think it's very. Chance. I think it's actually just really nice, genuine feel good. That's what the day felt like. Yeah. You know, I, I messaged Chloe and, and and said, you know, this is lovely. She goes, well, because they're not all they're not all thinking with their egos. You know, they're not, they're not like men. They're just all you know. They just want to have a good time and they're very sweet and they and they're all about the vibes. And yeah. I was like, well, I think you're absolutely right for the first time ever. So Stad Jean Dauga in Bayonne, I think yeah. Dauga, Dauga, um, eighteen thousand. So nice. if they can fill it. That will be impressive. And, will be. And, and in France, it, they they historically get a shed load of people too. Yeah, they do. The I did the games. 2014 World Cup and uh, they filled up um, Stade Jean Bouin where Stade now play. They do, Stade Jean Bouin. They do. Um, how long until we have a full Twickenham for a women's international? <sighs> I don't, I don't know. I How think, good would it be? To I, th- see I, a full I, I think. For it, I, I generally, I generally think if if that the should... women's World Cup was here this autumn, yeah, and New that. Zealand were on, and it was an England New Zealand final, and and New Zealand were on form, I reckon you'd be f- pretty close. You'd be. I think you could push it. Yeah, for sure. Or or even England France, because you know, like you said, they're passionate in France. Well, they have kind of been a bit ahead yeah, of us. Yeah, they'll bring it. They'll bring a fair few across. Yeah. yeah. I just think I just, that should yeah. be a goal for the next. But I think it is. We, uh, so I, on oh, the Wasp legend, I mean, I'll, I'll go, we'll come on to that in a oh, minute. Oh, yeah, 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 thank you. Sorry. Um, but one of the things, one of the one of the inductees, her her ambition is to, um, I think, the Sue Day, sorry, yeah, yeah. Sue Day's ambition is to get a full uh, Twickenham. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you'd said that kind of even two, three years ago, it, it yeah. would have been would have been a possibility. I think it genuinely is now. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it should be a standalone spectacle. Because normally, it was bolted on after the yeah. men's game. I think if they if if they keep that's the biggest thing they've got to have learned from the Six Nations. Yeah, is it stands alone. Yeah, yeah. And the difference it's made by it standing alone is incredible. And I think the social media coverage and actually the TikTok deal in particular. You know, the amount of young girls that were were at that place was just blown away. You know, you don't. I don't. You see a lot of young boys kind of or young children at the at the rugby but just it but was you pre- don't see young kids at Twickenham no 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 well, you but don't we because, know where that is yeah well because the barbers yeah. and the prawn sandwiches but, but do you know what well, I, I was and, talking, the, and the, the corporate side of it yeah, I was talking they're... to someone about that though and and why at Twickenham right because you can imagine the meeting going right guys we saw what happened at the um, Stade de France right France have literally written up the blueprint they had DJs in both ends of the stands they had lighting the commentator said the names there was chants there was lights there was spectacles there was everything and you come to Twickenham and the hierarchy of Twickenham you say well we need to do this now why? we sell every ticket 10 times we could sell it 10 times over and the point is there isn't the appetite to change it so it's a hard well, that, one is well, it you're already right. making as much money as you could make why would you ever want to diversify remarkably exciting times in the women's game and actually we had a brilliant day at Aberdeer where the star of the day was Fionn Lewis as well so Wales making good progress too the quality of the kids that we saw at Aberdeer yeah um, you know playing local derbies with 500 600 people watching the Colts yeah you know plus three three to five hundred watching the first in a game where they were expected not to come anywhere close and it went down to nearly the last play of the game yeah um I just, it just, you know, you look at Welsh rugby and people say, well, Welsh rugby is in a bit of bother, you know, mainly at regional level. Yeah. They're missing something. They're so missing something in Wales because they have unbelievable kids coming out. How many of those are getting lost? Why are they not local derbies? You know, the uh, Hugh Bennett was talking about the last time he played was in the testimonial match at the Knoll and it was full. Yeah. So there is an appetite there. But I think it's because it's built on these working class towns that want those rivalries. They want to be better than the town over over the valley. That sounds really stereotypical, but it's not. No. Generally, is the case. Yep. Uh, and they want to win those games, and those games matter more. And I think by separating, you know, putting Swansea and Neath together, putting you're losing you're losing that rivalry that really sort of fuels that the Welsh passion you yeah. know they they were brought up to hate the English that's why they love playing us and love beating us it's good us. for business as well I'm hating yeah. it do you know I mean it creates yeah. a spectacle it doesn't matter rivalries work um, just very quickly as we said exciting times in the women's game more on the women's six nations and Skaz's century in the next episode of the good of the Skaz and the rugby with Elmer and Mike Yee. looking forward to that yeah. um, very quickly because our guest has just arrived well done on the Wasps legends thank you are you pleased? Is it a good night? Do you know what? I was I was really pleased. I didn't, um, you know, I was well documented in both my kind of, my books about my trials and tribulations. Was, you know, it was always amazing on, on the field. It was always amazing with the boys, but it didn't always go quite well off, off the field in terms of the business aspect of it. 
But um, you know, when I got to the event, uh, Paul Doran Jones and Zoe Harbin, very kind, or Zoe Doran Jones, I should say, very kindly drove up and, and ventured the M1 on a Friday evening. We, we went to the Rico. I haven't been back there since I retired. Have you not? No. Um, and you know, you know it, was, it was amazing. And this is so to be inducted into the, 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 the Hall of Fame, right, is amazing. To become a Wasp Legend is great. There are plenty of better people than me that haven't been inducted yet. So I, I'm fully aware of my limitations. If you, were to, if you were to ask me, would I probably get into the best Wasp back row? Probably not. For me, it's always going to be Paul Volley, Joe Worsley and Lawrence Delalio. You know, uh, and those guys are the, the, the premier guys. But to just be welcomed in and part of it. And what I loved more than anything else, which is what rugby is about, was the, little, the moment you see a teammate you haven't seen for a while. You know, saw Je Jeff Probin was there. You know, Peter Scrivener. Um, you know, Will Green. Will Green used to walk past me in a corridor as an academy and go, "You made your bed. You made your bed. Haskell, lie in it and just walk off." And just he would just segue <laughs> these little bits. You know, let let's talk more action. That's all I'd get from him. <laughs> and, and but I'd love him, and I haven't I haven't seen him for years. And just to give you know, even Malcolm the Kit Man, Tree, Jeff Strange. So Jeff Strange is a legend at Was. He you know. <laughs> all you get from Jeff alright ask what are you doing Monday night fancy a game like Jeff I retired six years ago right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and he just come up to you and be like right right um <laughs> George Givington, Monday night, we're playing away at the police ground. You ready to play? It's like, George, no, Jeff, I, I'm playing for the first team. So Jeff was this amazing team manager that took the Wasps under 21s, unbeaten, with Johnny Ufton and these guys through it. And he oh, got, yeah. he, if, Jeff was the best thing. He was sitting on a table. He'd forgotten his hearing aids. And I was like, I was like, Jeff, <laughs> you're Jeff, you're, you're being inducted. What? You're being inducted, Hask? I was like, no, no, Jeff, you'll be like, am I? Am I? I was like, Jeff, look, you're in the fucking program. It's not me. I went, Jeff, no, <laughs> it, it, it is you, you're in the program. And then and then they went, and then they got um uh, uh, Bill, oh, Bill Treadwell, the best stitcher. Bill Treadwell is an amazing dentist, yeah. legend of the game. Er, you know, Eric um, player, he basically used to stitch up. He stitched, goes, one he of the stitch the greatest. Yeah, one of the kindest men ever. He was up there inducting them, and Jeff comes up the screen and went, "Jeff, you on the screen? Am I?" I was like, "Jeff, on the screen? Oh my god, god, bloody hell, I can't believe it!" Right, <laughs> get up, and then he got up, sat there. Both both Belfords interviewing him, and he's like, "What?" I can't hear, I can't hear. But it was it was amazing. And then but to see him, he was he's part of my childhood. You know, he he Malcolm the kit man, right? But like, Malcolm, you've lost the shirts. And because one of the boys could do an impression, they'd call, they'd call Malcolm up and be like, Malcolm, is Jeff here? You've left the shirts, right? And Malcolm, like, fucking prick. Jeff, fuck off, pal. You fucking idiot. Like, angry Scottish guy. We go, don't worry, don't worry. I'll meet you. I'll meet you in the team room, right? And Malcolm come and go, right, where the fuck is fucking Jeff? And it was one of the lads. And then Jeff, and we call up Jeff. And we're like, Jeff, where the fuck are you? Right, coming now, coming now. You just see these two old blokes <laughs> running, running around the training centre. And honestly, yeah, yeah. I still get messages from people going, oh, yeah, good. Ask, what are you doing Monday night? Fancy a game? Uh, honestly, and he's like a legend. So when I sat down there and got got inducted and do you know what? I got inducted with Mark Rigby and look I, I'll be honest with you I, 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 you know my desire to be the best player I could ever have been was what drove me and I worked incredibly hard is rugby my like life and soul now does it define me no but I gave everything I could do and I enjoyed the moments but when I saw what it meant for someone like Mark Rigby up there you know Dean Ryan introduced him on stage who himself is a Wasp legend and me seeing Dean for a while and Buster White and all these guys I haven't seen for years just having these little moments and Mark Rigby almost in tears on the stage just to be part of this amazing circle and, and if you'd I got inducted on the same day that Joe Worsley was inducted just before me and if you told me that my childhood hero a guy that taught me to tackle was going to be on the same bill and I was going to be inducted at the same time I would have laughed in your face and it's not about stadiums it's not about you know winning is fun but the best thing about rugby is it's meant to be fun. It's not meant to be fucking serious. It's not meant to be political. It's meant to be about good people playing together, having fun and those small bond relationships. And for me to be part of that circle, which I'll ever forever be bonded with them, is, is utterly amazing. Well done. Very, very proud of you. And looking forward to, yeah. Hope, do we do we get a, a suite to come and visit James Haskell Suite? Yeah. No, we, do, we never. No, no. <laughs> While Derek the owner's in charge, there'll be no suite. There'll probably be a portal in the car park. The James Haskell Suite. The, the James Haskell shitter. The, the James Haskell shitter yeah, with my face on the on the on the, on the, on the box seat. On the box seat. We're yeah. looking forward to using the James Haskell urinal. That's, <laughs> that's about where we sit. Right. Sorry, he's been waiting. Let's get to this week's guest. A brand new series is coming to Amazon Prime in the UK and Ireland. It's called Prep to Win, and it offers unprecedented access into the preseason training camp. Of of Harlequins. Viewers are taken inside the dressing room, uncovering behind the scenes moments and showcasing what it really takes to become the champions of English rugby. The three part documentary features interviews with players including Marcus Smith, Danny Kerr, Lewis Liner, and Joe Marchard. Here's a little clip at what's in store. 
I really took a long, hard look at my, my whole game, on the field, off the field, the way I was preparing at home. For me, I, I tried to take my kicking to the next level. Johnny Wilkinson, who, who really looks after me, Nick Evans as well, does some stuff with me. I've had long chats with Johnny about my mentality and in my early stages I used to think that if I didn't kick 100 balls or whatever it was or pass 100 balls that the game would go wrong. Speaking to Johnny, the biggest thing that I guess I've taken from him off the field is you don't need to drive yourself into pain, into injuring yourself or hurting yourself or harming yourself just to tick a box on doing 100 kicks. Ultimately, what I've learned is the most important thing is to be wheeled out on that field 100% ready. Now, the production company behind the series, Cine Baby Media, belongs to Benno Abano, the Bath and England prop who joins us on this week's show. Benno, it is very good to have you with us. How are you, first things first? How are you getting on at the moment? Yeah, I'm all blessed. I'm all blessed. I'm back in training and stuff. So, yeah, I'm, I'm actually pretty decent at the moment. And how is and the hinge, I was, was going to say? How is the knee? Uh, yeah, it's actually good. It's good. It's, it's not caused me any problems recently. Touch wood. So... How bad was the um how bad was that knee injury? And obviously I know you did your your ACL, but you've obviously we're gonna come on to what you, how you've used your time, but some dark times of it. Glad to be back. Did you think you were gonna make it back? Yeah, like obviously I did the other one and I, the other one was a lot worse than this one. This one was only ACL and MCL. The last one was all of them. So I did that in about nine months. So I just always thought I'd do this in roughly around six months. Um so yeah. I was pretty used to it. It was actually okay. Obviously back in training, but when do you hope to be back playing as well and, and properly ripping it up? Probably probably towards the end of the season. We've only got three games left, so hopefully I'll play in like a couple of those games. Good. Let's hope it's sooner rather than later. We're desperate to see you back doing what you do. But what's really nice about having you on the show at the moment is to talk about what you've been doing while you haven't been playing. And um, I've been watching, obviously, clips and snippets and trailers for your documentary it's not just a brilliant documentary, but it's a brilliant story in that you are the one who has made it, first of all. How proud are you of what you're about to release on Amazon Prime and I suppose the journey that you have been on with it personally? <laughs> this um, whole film was just like, it was proper long um, from the jump. Because like, we didn't only speak to Harlequins. Like, we spoke to a few other people and it was just made very, it was just made long. Like, the whole process has been long. Um, you don't even get yeses. Like even even people enjoy it, and they'll be like, "Well, it's club rugby, like you know, club rugby, club rugby." Um, and I just had to like convince people that it's good enough, and lots of people want to watch it. Um, and you had to like it was proper weird. Like I thought if I make a good enough product, people will just like like your product. But you have to like tell people how to sell the product as well. So so that was like part of it, and it was just a, a proper long process. It's been like a whole year since I think we first shot anything. Was it pure fluke that you've landed on Quinns? Because you just said you you know you uh, you spoke to other clubs. Did you have? Are you the the foreseer, the seer of seers, prognosticator of prognosticators in the fact that you can predict who's going to win the title in the year that you're going you're going to do a documentary on them? Nah, they were just, I, I think they were just the most keen because they had won the league. So they were like, yeah, yeah, come do a documentary with us because we just won it. So um, they were just proper keen after, well, we had spoken to people before and then they were proper keen once they had won it. So it just made sense, I think. I think it made sense for them to do it. I've got a question, Benno, because obviously I, you know, I've known you for a little while, um, but our sort of paths crossed in England. Now, I remember quite a fresh-faced Young Benno coming in, paraded at the front of the uh, team meeting with Eddie. One of your mates got you up there to to, to rap. Um, <laughs> and if you told me that you were going to make a, first of all, a documentary, um, Everybody's Game, and release it and it would go mega, and then also do a follow-up, I would have gone, I wouldn't have laughed, but I would have gone, really? Tell me... Just how the hell have you got into it? I mean, because this is a pretty amazing achievement, like incredible. You know, a lot of people start projects and I've started more than most. But to actually create, first of all, everybody's game and then the, this new one with Harlequins, um, just tell us step by step how this happened because it's amazing. Do you know what? Like, I, I, think, I think your response would be the only... I don't think you'd be the only person that would respond like that. Um, I think when people see me, they just don't... I'm actually not an idiot. Like, 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 big common idiot. Like, <laughs> um, I get that quite a lot, and it's like because you laugh a lot, and, and you like, and, and some of the captions that I put on my pictures and stuff like that, and they have a perception of you. Um, but I'm actually kind of smart, you know. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm really decent, but. I don't think it's that anyone doubts that. It's just, A, that I think any rugby player out there would be go time. Where do you find, obviously injury may, helps this one, but where do you find the time to do it? Where do you, where was the inspiration to make the, make the first one? I, basically, it all just stemmed from like, not my dislike, but my, I just don't love written media. Um, because like written media is essentially like, the perception of the person you're talking to, um, it's their it's their lens essentially. It's not actually there's a medium before it actually gets to the viewer, and I think there's an issue with that. There's it's like there is a place for it, but there's an issue if that's the only content that's provided. So if if the perception of the person is maybe not accurate of yourself, therefore the perception people get of you is then inaccurate, and. I just thought if I was able to put something on screen, if I was able, able to video something, then people can just get a direct connection with the person on screen, not through a medium. And that was basically the premise of starting documentaries. I was going to say, and I'd be interested in your view on this, it, it got absolutely nothing to do with anyone questioning how smart you are. The thing that I love about the story that you are telling is not only have you captured a remarkable tale in Quinn's, but the outer layer of that is that it's being told by a young, really bright prospect within the game. And we sit on this show regularly saying that we are terrified for young professional players in this day and age who throw that all into the game and they give absolutely everything and then a knee injury ends it and they're left with, you know, 50, 60, 70 games for their club and then they're starting again at the age of 27, 28, 29. What I love about this coming from outside the sort of, you know, the playing community is the fact that you are doing some incredible work with your production company and combining it as one of the bright young prospects in the game itself. So I just wondered, you know, obviously you're incredibly proud of the project, but I, I wondered whether you're also quite proud of the journey that you are on combining these two elements within your life. Um, there was like a thing, like, because, like, obviously, I, everyone sort of, like, wants, thinks about what they want to be, like, when they're 30, 35, et cetera, or, like, when they retire, for example, or, like, in the future. And I just thought, Ben was like, you're not in control of if people pick you or not. All you can do is be available. And a part of me was just like, you just dive into this rugby hole that you're not in control of. Um, and I just thought, if I can try and do stuff in my spare time, you can get to 30 and be more proud of what you've done. Like you can be proud of other accomplishments as well. Um, and you can be a more rounded person because those are people that I admire. I admire people that are like good at more than one thing. Um, and it was just sort of, that was basically the premise of like starting to do, to do other things. Like I do a master's and, and other stuff as well. And it was just, if I just do other things and I, I keep going with the rugby and I do well, it's just sort of like I'll get to 30 and be proud of all that time. Otherwise, you get to 30 and you're just like, oh, like this coach or that coach or this opportunity or that. Do you know what I mean? And Because there's only a select few that it, it happens perfectly for. Um, so I just wanted to be more in control of my destiny for a better word. So are you a rugby player who has a production company or are you a producer who plays a bit of rugby? <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a rugby player first, 100%. Uh, uh, I'm a rugby player first. Like I think that is the the heart of everything that I do. Um, and it's, it's, it, I basically stopped doing everything else to play rugby. So like um, rugby comes first, it's the first priority. But like the other stuff that I have to do, I just think it's important because like, how are you going to look at yourself if you just don't, if you waste your time? Because like when you're younger, you put loads of time into rugby, like because you don't know what's going to work. You know what I mean? So you do every stretch session, you do every conditioning session, you go, you do every gym session. But as you get older, you realise what works for you. And as you realise what works for you, you're able to streamline that process and then you're able to have more time. Um, that's what I found at least. And that time now I can use for other things. With you 
being known to all the Quinns guys and everything, did you find you you know it became a lot more easier to promote these guys as genuinely how how they are to their friends and their family rather than as you said sometimes through print media it's not particularly it's someone else's perception of a bloke rather than the actual bloke did you find were they more than happy to help did they really want to make it a success for you on the other side they were like some of them were proper helpful uh, i think some of them have got the cameras rolling it sometimes that's yeah. the best way I, say some stuff, I was like brother um, <laughs> yeah, yeah i think some people have got the cameras rolling and it was just basically like people like marcus like because there's i don't know if you guys have seen it at all I don't know if you've got something. Yes, yeah, 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 we've seen it. Um, but like there's episode two where we get to go to his house. And obviously when we go to his house, um, it's just like he, he, he didn't have to do that. He could have said no, um, could have made it difficult, but he was like, yeah, come through. Um, so I thought that was like a real cool thing for him to do. And Lennox did the same with his mum. And it was just like little bits and bobs like that. And they were like proper helpful to, to, to get it done. Because I think, I think it benefits them as well. I think like there's they've got vested interest in it as well, and I think we all have an interest in making it successful because everybody benefits from it. I, um, so that they were proper helpful. How did you get into particularly the kind of the filmmaking side? Because you know, being the kind of media whore that I am, you know, I could <laughs> knock up a video. I've appeared in, I've appeared enough of them, but to direct a documentary in terms of a the aesthetic you would choose, the different shots you want narrative that is a massive um you know sort of journey to go on from relatively little experience i mean how, how did you get into it and why did you know it was documentaries you wanted to do you know more, more than anything else so like it initially started when i like fell in love with like the nfl documentaries everyone's probably watched them i'm not even talking all or nothing i'm talking about the ones that they make on the nfl network and they used to make these ones with like retired players and i remember i used to watch like People like Jerome Bettis, if you know who that is, and he'd like make like America's Game and it'd be like a full documentary on him. And that's where it started. And then I started to watch like 30 for 30s quite a lot. Um, and I watched like loads of 30 for 30s. There's this one called Fantastic Lies, which was basically on a lacrosse team. But I found it like proper interesting. And I've never watched lacrosse before. And don't know anything about lacrosse yet. I've watched a whole documentary about lacrosse and I told people to watch it as well. So I just thought you can make sport enjoyable even if you don't follow the sport and then so I had this idea in mind to do everybody's game or a documentary like everybody's game and then weirdly enough I went to the Prem launch and when I was at the Prem launch um, a, a production company because you know they just have lots of different production companies one just got in touch with me and was like oh we would love for you to do a documentary like, like on me and I was like look big man I've got an idea <laughs> I've been thinking about this documentary that I want to do for a while so then I basically told them about it and they probably didn't get the vision straight away. And then slowly and slowly we got there. And when it comes to like shots and music and all that sort of stuff that you ask about hats, it's sort of like YouTube. Like it was just like, okay, Google's free. I can figure it out, surely. Like I have an idea in mind, but it's so hard. What I found difficult or what I found I had to learn was to be able to communicate your idea to someone else to edit it. And that's basically, I had to learn the names of exactly what I wanted to do. And that's basically what I did. I just learned over lockdown what to do. And we just went for it that way. So, so everybody's game, when you look back at it, is kind of your first project. Because I know from kind of the music production stuff where you start out on a journey to make something and you have, you know, and then halfway through, you're like, this is amazing. And obviously, you know, a couple of tweaks, a couple of edits, you know, we've all seen movies that the trailer's better than the movie. Um, you know, and you know it better than anything that editing can, can take time. Do you, do you look back at everybody's game? Are you happy with it? Do you think that from what, you know, what you've done with Harlequins is now light years ahead of that? I mean, you know, because like, obviously a lot of people sometimes don't love their projects after a while. Where are you at with it? I haven't really watched it again because you watch it like a million times before it comes out. I haven't really watched it again since it came out. And because I'm in it, you know when you're watching stuff back that you're in, it's not the same. Do you know what I mean? You feel uncomfortable at certain points of things that you said or the way you said it. Um, you're like really pernickety about yourself. So I haven't watched it back, but I'm happy with the response it gets. Like, like something happened with um, one school. So like a private school got in touch and they were like, we're going to fund a child to go to school there. And then the donor said, oh, they heard that. And they're like, we'll match it and we'll fund another child to go there from South London. So um, 
to go through the school, which I thought was pretty cool. And that's off the back um, of your documentary. That, wow. um, so it's like a full bursary to go to go to the school for sixth form for the last two years. So we, we have we find the people every year now um, to do it, uh, which is pretty cool. And I just thought that like if if that is the response from it, it has to be a half decent documentary. Um, whilst like the Harlequins documentary is a little bit different to that, um, but I think the Harlequins one's better than better than everybody's game. And I think the trailer probably doesn't even show half the stuff because Flats is proper good in it. And um, obviously Flats is not in the trailer at all. Can I ask you about the process? Because I mean, we'll come back to, to your role within the company and your role within the documentary, but I'm fascinated. And we, we've spoken a lot about how rugby sells itself. And that's part of the reason I'm so excited to hear your story and to see what it is that you're doing. And Victoria Rush as well with No Woman, No Try. It's fantastic to see content creators, really good content creators within the game, telling stories with a fresh perspective. When you came up with the idea and you built a treatment or whatever, and you then went to clubs, as you said, how many clubs did you go to? And what was the sort of generic response before Quinn said, let's do it? Were Quinn's first up or did you try others? So like the series wasn't meant to be solely, I don't even know if I should be giving this away, but (laughs) we're here now. (laughs) <laughs> um, the series wasn't meant to be for one club like initially it wasn't meant to be for one club we had like created we had created a document created a deck and the series was meant to be for like various clubs and it was supposed to run it was probably supposed to run a little bit longer and so obviously that's what I did so we created that spoke to them and a lot of them said yes to start off with but then basically like a lot of them just filler busted you into like making it impossible because you're like oh we need to shoot today or we need to shoot this time and they're like oh but we need to do x y z z z z z and then we're like but we need to shoot we need to start and you knew that we needed to start but you didn't let us start basically do you know what i mean um and then because that was the issue we were just like okay can then who's the most interested and then there was two clubs that was interested and harlequins was one of them just to get it just to get a good piece of content so and then obviously Harlequins are champions, so I was like, okay, we're going to start with Harlequins. Interesting. I was going to say that that's the best use of the term filibuster because I know I know it from I know it from obviously you know what they do in, in um, Congress, but I've never heard it used yeah. in terms of and that is exactly what rugby does on every <laughs> decision. Ever. They filibuster you into just giving up and going, can we have a global season? No. Can we build up some players? No. Can we all be it's aligned? Like a sexy beast. No. Yeah, <laughs> no. No, it's amazing. Well, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, I digress. I just thought I'd comment on that unbelievable use of language. Did any of them shut the door immediately or not even open the door because it was a professional player from another club trying to come in and tell the story of a, a club with whom he's not affiliated? I don't, I don't know if that was like a, a thing, really, because like, I felt that was in their interest because I know the game. I felt like if a media person comes in, all they want to do is tell the story. They don't really care about the people involved. They, their faces don't have to be seen again. I, I, have, to, I have to see you in, in, the, in the next season. Do you know what I mean? So like, you're going to see me around. So it's sort of like the players and the people involved, they knew that if it was someone to come externally, it's sort of like, all we have to do is get a good story. The story doesn't even have to be true. You can sort of see it happening with Drive to Survive at the moment with how the, the drivers talk about the series and they don't think it's accurate. And it's sort of like, well, it doesn't have to be because you ain't seeing James Gay Reese again. Um, do you know what I mean? They're just taking it and, and leaving. Whilst like me, I'm in it. So like I can't alienate myself in that sense where I create something that's untrue or shows people in a bad light. And then next thing you know, people just don't want to work with you again. Um, I've got, got a question. Obviously, it, it kind of segues nicely onto the fact that you, so you didn't want to stitch people up. Rugby in itself is an interesting story. You have the accountability because you know they're going to see you and some of these guys are your friends. But actually, in Prep to Win, you cover some quite serious issues. You know, with Lennox talking about how he almost gave up with pressure. You talk about injuries and collisions um, with David Flatman, and, and you know, and he, you know, he's a great point with David Flatman. He says, you know, he wonders whether young players would have signed up to play at eighteen if they would be told by the time they're fifty they're going to have dementia. I mean, how did you deal with that? And were you shocked by some of the honesty, or was that the kind of narrative you were going for? I was actually a little bit shocked. Um, we 
I sat there when I when we got the tape back, we sat there and we like looked at it and we were like, can this go in? Because we weren't trying to like we weren't trying to do we weren't trying to make something that was controversial. Um I'm not a big controversial. I like I just like good content. I don't feel like you have to throw someone into a deep dark hole to to make them enjoy something or shock them to make them enjoy something. Um and so it was just sort of like, okay, should we put this in or not? And I was just like and I sent it around to a few of my friends and we sat down with the producers and it was just sort of like, well, it's the reality of it. So we have to put it in. We have to address it. Um, and I didn't, I didn't really expect everybody to be so open. Um, but I knew I could probably go down at them, you know, to make them laugh a little bit and go down at them. But I, I didn't expect everyone to be so open, especially flats. And fortunately they were and we just got good content from it, basically. Like, I think you've spoken about it before, and rugby likes to shy away from the fact it's a collision sport. Um, and I just, I wanted to dive right into that. Um, and you can see it with, like, some of the stuff that I put up, especially at the beginning of the training, for example. And I wanted to understand that people admire, people like yourself, Hashtag, for the fact that you guys are warriors, you're gladiators. And it was, and you have done something great at a high level when you come off and your face is bleeding and it's, we're, we're watching that and entertained by it. And I just don't think we should shy away from that. And I really didn't want to shy away from it in the documentary. I, I mean, it's just, a, I think you're exactly right. And we, we have hammered it in terms of, um, you know, the fact that rugby is a dangerous game. Like this, we need to probably do much more to look after players and kind of, you know, make it safer, but we can't, you know, it is a gladiatorial battle. You know, we like watching people have collisions. That's what sells the game. We like people carrying hard. I mean, I wondered it with the kind of honesty, especially around flats. You know, you're a young front row. You know, you've had a couple of injuries yourself. Did it, just from an emotional point of view, you're putting out that story. And like, I agree with you. You don't need to sensationalise stuff in rugby because the raw nature of it itself sells the story. But did you sort of make you think a little bit of your own mortality? Were you sitting there going, wow, you know, maybe I should stick to documentary. Am I prepared to... <laughs> maybe I should flip it around. I'm yeah. a producer that... Tem- <laughs> there you go. Yeah, what, did rugby. you have those thoughts? Was it emotional on you? No, like, well, when I was making it, I was like, bro, if this hits, I might have to retire after like, 31 now, like, do a new goal or something. <laughs> like, it just goes, whoa. That, was, that genuinely went through my head. I called my friends. I was like, bro, if we get paid for this, <laughs> I'm done at 31. I won't even lie to you. Um, but that was the only thing that came into my mind. It was sort of like... Bro, like rugby is a tough game, and if you if you can get out early and be comfy, still get out early and be comfy. Do you know what I mean? Um, but that was only it. Yeah, that was it. I mean, I okay. Look, I'm gonna let you into a little secret, and my 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 shallowness is there for everybody to see. Right, <laughs> but when I saw you done everybody's game. I was like, A, I was like blown away. I could not be more impressed with you. And like, A, because of all the mechanics and how hard it is. Then I saw you done prep to win. And I was like, is this guy making bank? Because did you, did you get paid some cash? Are we going to get a drink out of you at some point? Are you rolling around a new set of wheels? I just need to know. You don't have to go into figures, but I want to know. Does, does it pay or does it not pay? <laughs> See me pay, <laughs> yeah, it pays, bro. Right. I, I wanted to know. It pays, yeah, it's, it's- but yeah, is it, a, is it, yeah, sorry, I was going to say on a serious note about this in terms of obviously Amazon is a huge beast are, are they are they coming back and going right w- what are you thinking about your next project uh, are they are they wanting then to sort of follow that up are we now going to be looking at well, we've seen what Drive to Survive has done for the average average not non-fan of, of F1 it's completely changed their game now is that something that, what you're hoping that will then feed through and, and make our elevate our game to her you know, we, we talk about what's going to change it to be a global game. We're nowhere near a global game yet, but, uh, you know, more access to the players to find out actually who the players are rather than, you know, everyone following a team. Let's hear everyone's backstory. Do you think you're going to get that sort of, sort of support and it could be something that kicks off in that way? Yeah, I don't know. I don't. It, it, this series, a lot does hang on it. I feel like, because I had to like, the conversation I had with Amazon around the series we had to properly discuss the fact that it was club rugby. Like, I won't lie to you. Um, so, like, when we had that conversation, it was just sort of like, we have to see how well it does. Like, this is somewhat of a pilot season. Um, and we have to see if we get the response that I think we'll get, that maybe young people don't think we'll get. 
So it's sort of like when we know whether it does well or not, it would determine what happens on the on the back end because it was a risk to take this. Like it's a lot easier to go do an international team and if you're going to stay in rugby, say do an international team and it's, you'll do okay. Um, it may not be as entertaining, but you'll do okay regardless because people are going to watch it. So it's just like, can we ensure that people want to watch club rugby essentially or watch something based on club rugby? But back to another point you said, it was sort of like, I said this to someone else the other day, like people, like your average person goes and watches their son or brother or or family member or friend play sport on like a Saturday or Sunday. They don't watch it because it's a great spectacle. They only watch it because they have a vested interest in that person. So you've got these people that would already watch the game. Now just give them a vested interest in these people and you're going to gather so many more people to watch. And I just thought, it's just, it's just basic. Like, it's not difficult to do. And they, there's so much content left out on the table for rugby. There's just so much. So I just think someone has to lack of it. Benno, one of the things that fell out, and correct me if I'm wrong, of, of everybody's game is that your journey into rugby was was sort of, it was quite hard fought. It wasn't a sort of seamless arrival, et cetera, like, like others potentially. And I wondered if that was the case, how much is documentary telling and opening up the sport and making it, in inverted commas, everybody's game? How much of that is a motivation for you? Do you know what, Like, I, I actually probably feel like a, I feel like it's, it's I should do it. I feel like we all should, to be fair. But I just felt that if we leave the game in the same place that it was like 10 years ago, I just think we just flopped. Like all of us have just flopped a little bit. Um, and and then what we're doing afterwards, do you know what I hate? This is what I hate the most. Man. Like I see, I see people that are in positions that can do something, say, why isn't rugby growing? And that bugs the life out of me. Like, genuine. Everyone wants to say, like, we need to grow the game. We need to. And it's like, yeah, cool, it. do something then, bruv. And I just think, I just think, I didn't want to be that guy. Like, I didn't want to be that guy that's saying, we need to change something. We need to change something. <laughs> Someone's got to do it. So just, Ben, why don't you do it, innit? That's, that, that, was, that basically bugs me. Um, that's a real bugaboo of mine. Um, I actually read an article the other day that annoyed me, and that's probably what I said. I'm going off about it now. Do, do something then, bruv, is a t-shirt, yeah, isn't yeah, it? That, the that is, that, we're going to make that uh, good, the bad, the do something, bruv. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I want to follow up and ask you, therefore, is given how you made your way into the game and given what you know from obviously playing at Bath and given that you've played for your country and given the access that you've now had at Quinns, does rugby sell itself well enough? Oh, uh, no, of course not. No, no, it doesn't do a great job of it. Um, do you know what I find? I find that there's a lot of... Because there's not a ton of money in it just yet. There's a lot of short-termism. Um, in order to, like, keep the money that they have, you just have... You can't look too far ahead because you have to just ensure that you can get to tomorrow. Um, and that, that's, like, a big issue. And there probably needs to be a plan in place which is, like, a proper long-term plan. Maybe there is. I don't know. Maybe there actually is that I don't know about. But I haven't seen evidence of it just yet. I wondered if, um, you know, in terms of your reaction, or sorry, or the reaction that people have had to the documentaries, both of them, how have they been received? Not by, not by your mates or not by you, but in general in in rugby circles. Because I, you know, going on to the back of, does it sell itself? I don't think we're particularly progressive as a rugby. I don't think we're particularly. I think we're particularly set in our ways. And I wonder whether a young upstart you know, creating his own documentaries, doing this, doing something that's never been done before, being, you know, unabashedly his own character. How has that gone down? Generally positive or a few raised eyebrows? No, I haven't had any raised eyebrows. I'm waiting for one. Um, but I haven't had any yet. People are just like, oh, that's sick. Like, um, even, even the older people um, have been, like, really supportive of it. Um, and it's not like, it's not like I did it while... I, like, I, if I was playing, and obviously we see the current position of, of, of our club, um, and I was playing and every week the results weren't going our way, it's sort of, maybe I'd probably get a different response, who knows? Um, but obviously I haven't been able to play, I've been hurt, um, and I've rehabbed pretty well to, to hopefully make it back by the end of the season. So it's sort of like, I've kind of done my job still. Um I think if it were to get in the way of what I was actually paid to do on a daily basis, 
I think then maybe you might get a different response. Do you think that's been part of it, though, that you are showing? Because obviously, if you come back in in a speedier time than than most come back from an ACL MCL. Are you showing that actually to well, not just to yourself, but to people who watch the documentary and future eighteen-year-olds just coming into the game? If you can, as you use the word, streamline your time, you can do these things, and it can be done. And even when you're back playing, because you know how your body feels, what you need to do to get from uh, from Saturday to Saturday and play at the top level, you can still do this. Do you think you know you shouldn't be getting those people who raise their eyebrows? Eh? Of course, like. It's it's it's, sure <laughs> it's 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 one weird thing in in the world that like once you do something you can't do something else like it's like the the human mind naturally processes things that you have to do one thing and you can't do something else like it, it has to be but like until you show them how it's done they just won't understand it um, and it's sort of like when I saw it with Calvin Lewis. Um, the other day, like he's on the front of something dressed in a way I wouldn't dress, but you know, <laughs> so their own. Um, and obviously, Everton aren't doing so well, and people are like bashing him for it. I'm like, bro, if he didn't dress like that and didn't stand on the front of the magazine, they wouldn't do any better. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just like people think there's a correlation, and there's actually not. Um, and, uh, Why do you think that no. is compared to, you know, obviously you're a big fan of American sports and that is something that never comes into even no. question in, Amer- in American sport like about, yeah, you could, you know, Rob, well, exactly. Rodman used to go for a three day bender and then come back and he'd still get man of the match. So you still always got to back it up. But, you know, it's treated differently. Athletes are athletes on the field, but then what they do off off is just a commercial activity that everyone understands that that's what that's what they do. That's why they're paid to do commercial activity. It's part of their salary. Whereas still over here, it seems that if you can't, you can do it as long as you're winning. But if you're not winning, you yeah. can't do it. But I, I think that's a little bit misleading because, like, if you properly watch American sport, like. So if you know who Baker Mayfield is, Baker yeah. Mayfield had, had a good season, for example. And Baker is in, like, a lot of commercials. Um, and he's been, I think they're Farm State? No, it's not Farm State. I, don't, I can't remember what it is. But he's in a lot of commercials. And he's getting hit proper hard because he had a bad season and he's in a lot of commercials. So, like, it does happen as well in America. Um, it's not like it doesn't happen. It's just that it's less so, I think. Um, I was going to say Cam Newton as but well. It does happen in, in America as well. Cam, Cam Newton. Yeah, Cam that. gets it as well. Russell Westbrook gets it as well. Um, so, so they do get it, um, but they just need to. In, in the UK, it's just like you can't do anything else. Like as soon as something's not going well, you just get hit hard, and that's that's probably a, a problem in the UK as well. I think as I, well. I, I don't think there's like. Yeah. I think a lot of that as well is actually um, the older kind of coaching staff mentality that's still in that. Because I think sports fans, what we've learned looking at any sport is they're not blessed with rationality. Hence, they love the... The, the roller coaster of of sport, but that, you know I've had that before when things aren't going well. Well, you're doing this on your day off, you're doing that, you're doing this. You're like, well, I'm doing everything I should be doing. And actually, Tins asked a, a great question because I wondered actually with a knee injury because I actually thought <laughs> I had said something the other day because I hadn't seen it. it's like it's better retired. He's now doing this full time. And they went, no, he's having he's, he's, <laughs> he's got a, he's got a knee injury. He's he's coming back for it. The fact you managed to balance it actually does show you that. And I would say. What, for example, Restart does, in one hand, says to a player, right, broaden your horizons, you know, do things outside your sport. Every time I was injured, I focused on everything else as well as my rehab. So rehab was nailed, say, you know, seven in the morning till 12. And then you've got the rest of the day to then make the most of it. And actually, I imagine for you, focusing on something else probably took you out of a dark hole with your knee and gave you much more balance to life than anything else, which a lot of sports fans don't understand. Yeah, they just don't get it. And they always see, like, the smallest bit if, 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 do you know what I mean? Like, if if they probably saw the whole day, they wouldn't feel like that. But the, maybe one publication that probably was done months ago, um, and they see they, they just see you enjoying yourself, and they think that you weren't working earlier in the day, for example. And it's just like it's just very hard for people to comprehend those things. And it's just I I, I don't think it's going anywhere. <laughs> I don't think it's going anywhere. I think they'll stay there for the rest of time because we have idiots in our society. <laughs> um, but it's just that 
it's just that hopefully there's less idiots as we as we continue just preaching that same message. I want to just pick up on something you said actually, which is that rugby is really bad at sort of. If I asked the question, but you said it's really bad at selling itself. I think it is trying, and yeah. I think the tide is slowly turning. And I think the arrival of brands like TikTok into the sport are a good thing. I think it's fantastic to have Amazon opening up space for proper documentaries for the likes of Benno and Victoria Rush, as you said. As I'm saying that, I am still thinking that the greatest piece of rugby content was Living With Lions, which was 25 years ago, and yeah. nothing's ever come close. What that showed you <laughs> is what... All, all that's doing is doing what Benno's doing with, with his team. And it, it was just that it was the only... It was an amateur era where no one really cared, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. But but I think in some ways, the fact that no one has been able to better that in 25 years is a really sad indictment. Yeah. When you can see what you can do... And yet, no one's had the bravery to open up that level of access. Do you know what I think? It's actually, you know, with with prep to win, right? For an example, is actually more often than not with a lot of the issues that rugby deals with, um, you know, which we talk about LGBT. Q plus stuff, all this other kind of stuff. I think there's a potential fear that if I was to do something, would it be accepted? Yeah. I kind of like what Benno's done. He's just gone and done it and then sold it, and then people go, oh, well, we really like that. That's yeah. really interesting. And I think what rugby suffers from is the perception that it won't be accepted or things won't be accepted. But more often than not in life, you find people, for the most part, are actually much more accommodating yes. and much more accommodating about lots of issues. And I think with rugby, what it needs is people like Benno, is people like, well, you know, us to a certain degree, and some other brave people just to go, we're doing it, we've done it, here it is. And I think you'll be blown away by their action, just as I think Amazon people on Amazon will love what, what he's done because what everybody loves about rugby or sport in general is the people, is the personalities, is the journey, is the hardship, is the ups and downs. The game itself is almost secondary to, to that. If you've got a good gun, bunch of people, that's what sells it. I think what we have to do, or what, what Ben, you have to keep making, is just making these documentaries, rolling them out, educating, and because I think people come around to it. I don't know what you feel about that. It depends on how, I'm, I'm sort of going on how well this one goes um, as to whether I make another one. Um, as it's like a big year for me next year because obviously it's a World Cup year, um, so it's just like you know you want you want to be involved in that. Uh, so I presume in a playing year, kind of a big year. So I presume in a playing capacity rather than a documentary capacity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, <laughs> in a playing capacity. So <laughs> I don't know if I'll I'll, have, I'll really want to do the doc um, as much, but we'll, we'll, I'll figure it out. Um, as time goes on, I just don't want to commit to saying, yeah, I'm definitely going to do it. And I don't decide I has it, has it, sorry, has Eddie, has Eddie commented on this at all? Not yet. I'm <laughs> waiting for him to. Uh, not on Prep to Win. And it's funny because we've actually got a session in England, like before you start, it's called Prep to Win. And I think that's where it must have come from. <laughs> um, so I'm waiting for him to say something about the name. Um, you should have called it Bacon and Eggs, nah, like the morning yeah, session. Been. Yeah, bacon and eggs. I should have it. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you a couple of questions? So, first of all, we're talking about rugby making effort to try and sell itself better. Has the phone rung since this has obviously been announced and released, and it's it's getting going? Have you had people saying, "Actually, we made a mistake last time. We're keen to do more." In fact, one of the clubs that I didn't speak to hit me like the day the trailer um, came out, and they were like, "If you're going to do a season two, could you consider us?" the first choice to do it um so so that was pretty positive um but i had a team in mind to be fair already that i wanted to do um and hopefully hopefully what happens is they watch it the clubs watch it and they're like oh this is actually good for us like this <laughs> we actually will benefit from this so. that is really good news i'm very pleased to hear there's inbound traffic rather than just picking up the phone to others where do you want to go, Benno? Where do you want to be? Obviously, back playing, I know, is the priority, but just with the production element and what you're doing, where would you like to be 5, 10, 15 years' time? What do you want to do with this long term? You know, the idea behind Threat to Win was to create a series which could follow any sports team. Like, we follow a team over their preparation phase. And as we follow a team over their preparation phase, we then release it when it's close to them reaching their goal, the, the goal that they've been preparing for. So it was sort of like we could follow any team and if, if it were to create into something that is in that sense, because there's nothing like it, um, that can follow athletes and gets really close to the athletes and has the themes that are involved in this one, um, that would be pretty cool um, in like 10, 15 years if it just ran consecutively every year or every couple of years, that, that would be sick. Um, but 
I would hope I wouldn't have to direct in like 10 years and I just sort of exec produce and oversee it all and someone else directs it. Um, but that would be the plan. That would that would be the dream in 10 to 15 years. Yeah. What a boss. Do you, do you want to be bo- behind the camera? Would you, do you fancy little cameo roles on the on the silver screen? Or is it just strictly the production and no, kind of... behind the, the camera is always better. I think behind the camera is just, just so much better. It's just, you actually get the vision across. When when you're in front of the camera, it's just, it's not the same. Like, people like you more. You probably get more followers from it, but you don't actually get to create the product that you enjoy as much. Well, now- you know, have you ever watched Genius? Where, like, Kanye is like, oh, like, I'm producing these beats, I'm producing these beats. But I have so many thoughts in my head that I need to start rapping when he's producing these beats. And that's that's like when you're direct, when you're just sitting on the screen, it's like when you're just in front of the screen, it's like, well, I have so many ideas of how good this thing could be. Therefore, I have to direct it or produce it. Are you comparing yourself to Kanye? <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what Alex Payne does. Ah, Alex Payne, you made me sick. <laughs> we just talked that, about yeah. that's our promo for this oh, week's no, show. I'm actually yeah. sad you didn't lose now. Fuck yeah. it. Oh, oh, we just talked. We just <laughs> talked about no need to stitch up talent in sales itself. But thanks, for, thank you, Kanye, for coming in. Uh, look forward to seeing the first uh, clip down uh, of the good, the bad, the rugby this week. <laughs> Uh, I want to ask you a couple of questions just about you before we finish up. So obviously, you know, back training, playing, etc. You've done a, uh, signed a new deal with Bath as well. Was that a simple decision, easy decision? Did you think long and hard about it? Did you have a few people getting in touch, not just for documentaries, but for your playing services? I don't think it's ever a simple decision. Like, you know when people are like, yeah, it was an easy decision. Like, yeah, I was always going to sign on. <laughs> They're liars. <laughs> They're liars. <laughs> Especially when you're, you're 27 and you're not. I don't really want anything yet. Um, I don't think it's ever a simple decision. Um, but obviously, when we spoke to, like, obviously I had conversations with people at the club and we had a lot of conversations about where the club's going to go, and what we're going to do. And you've had those conversations a million times, but I think there might be actually some change now, which, like, suggests that it made sense to sign up or to continue. Um, and yeah, so that was basically it really, but, it, it wasn't an easy decision, no. Have you, I mean, it must have been a brutal season all round for, for obvious reasons at Bath. Did yeah. you, were you in there a lot and sort of helping where you could or did you let them get on with it because you had another a project to be kind of keeping yourself focused on? How have you played your role within the club this season? I haven't really played a role. I won't lie to you. Um, I just, I've just been rehabbing. I just thought the best role I can play is try and get back as soon as possible. Um, if, if people want to discuss stuff, then I discuss it with them. But when you're on a rehab schedule, your schedule doesn't really follow the schedule of the squad. So it's all in and out, in and out. And you don't particularly... It's, you can try and have an impact on a short-term injury. Like, say you've got a two-monther, then, you know, you can sort of still stay with the squad. But when you're injured six to nine months, like, you just need to get on with your own stuff. Really. Yeah. I love the fact earlier you mentioned the World Cup as well. The number of times that we have, uh, so you read people talking about, I'm just focusing on next week, etc. You know, you've had a little taste of it. Um, I know, obviously, you're desperate to get back there, but where are those hunger levels? You know, those those levels of desire, and I suppose those levels of belief as well, given what you've had to go through to, to get back in your boots. Like sometimes, like, I was in a scrum the other day, and I was like, I just remembered, I was like, yeah, like, I can play still. Um, like, I'm actually good. So. I just think, like, when I'm just hoping the plan is, like, I just keep preparing and you keep working hard and you keep doing everything you're supposed to do, it will just come to fruition, like, whether, like, I've never been too upset about selection, I won't lie to you, just because I I do I do the work um, and I'm always, like, content within myself that I've done the work and I'll continue to push doing the work. So, like, I'm, there's a lot of hunger there for it because I think, I think your career sort of always gets to this point where it's like tilting, like which way is it going to go? Um, and I feel like that's probably like where my career is right now. Um, and like, if you get to do those things and achieve those things, then your career goes in the direction you want it to. So 
that's that's basically what I'm, I would love to, to play in, obviously. I thought that quick, that answer was going to go very different. I thought you were going to say, I was in a scrum the other day and realised why the fuck I should be making documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> but, mate, once, once, a front, once a front row, always a, um, a front row. But, look, uh, mate, I think it's amazing what you're, what you're doing. Where can people find out more about both the documentaries, obviously on, on Amazon, but do you have social media and stuff that people can get hold of you on? Well, like, obviously, yeah, I'm on Instagram, Silly Baby Events. Um, but I don't really tweet. I only put tweets up when I want to promote my documentary. I'm doing that. I want to. So, um, but yeah, on, on Instagram, I'm active, I guess. Yeah. And the documentaries are both on Amazon? Yeah, both both are on Amazon. Um, obviously, uh, Prep to Win comes out on the 28th. Yeah, so it's... Tw- hopefully it does really well and tell your friends. Are you cousins with Marrow? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So like, his whole family will be there as well. They're, they're all there. Yeah. Good on you, yeah. darling. Is he investing? Is he asking you to get in on the action? There's a documentary there, I'm sure, in the not too distant no, future. I told these guys to invest. They didn't want to listen. I told Anthony and Mara to invest from the jump. They didn't want to listen. Um, to be fair, I don't push them hard, but. You know, maybe if this one slaps, they'll invest in Timmy Baby. I'll, I'll invest. I was about to say that. <laughs> yeah. send, send me the deck. I'm yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, just as soon as you said, as soon as you said you're making bank, I'm in. Yeah, I'm yeah. in. <laughs> um, do you know, Bella? This has been. <laughs> This has been one of the most enjoyable shows we've done in a long time. And I'm in awe, not only of you as a player, but just the fact that you are doing some incredible work as well. And we wish you the very, very best of luck with it. I'm fascinated to see where it goes from here. Keep in touch. Um, genuinely, we'd love to see where it goes. If we can help at all, do let us know. But um, yeah, enjoy the premiere. Enjoy all the trappings that come with it. And obviously we're always available for any gigs that yeah. are going around. Yeah. 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 If you need three white yeah. middle class... <laughs> You'll be the first person to call. <laughs> if you need three white middle class people <laughs> to sell anything you're doing, we're in, mate. Yeah, that's lovely, man. I, I know what you guys sell. I mean, we'll sort of sign up. We can talk. You know? I've got people to talk to your people. Oh, you know what it is. Perfect. I love, I, I love how you've come on. You've got people. Before, no, you no. didn't have any people. I had people. Now, yeah. you've got people. That no, I, you know. I didn't have people before. Now. <laughs> <laughs> we sorted this out. You know, I didn't have people before. People sort it out now. Yeah. I love that. So oh, are you too God, much. Man. I can't wait to see the most rascal outfit you've got to bowl down because now you've got a bit of cash. Let's see what outfit you come to the premiere tomorrow in London in. <laughs> I want to see that on the Insta, on, yeah. the, on the social media. Beno, thank you so much for joining us. Good luck with all that's to come. Get back and get doing what you do as quickly as you can on the field of play. Um, we'll look forward to following your progress with real interest. Beno Barno, ladies and gentlemen, rugby's new Kanye. I think that's one of the most refreshing shows we've done in a long time. Yeah, he was brilliant. I thought it was a bit of a slow start. When he, you, know how, you know what? This is what I had going through my head, and Beno won't mind. When we started asking the first couple of questions, he was giving like simple one-word answers, and I was thinking... You're a director. <laughs> You've been sitting opposite people. You must know that we want, we need sound bites. But then, he, but then he he warmed up and he was utterly brilliant. I think he is a shining light of um, what's good about rugby. Just because even if you just take it for a minute and step back and go, he while injured has twice filmed yes. two incredible documentaries, and that's not just like a crap project like writing a book like me or doing something else or like you know making making a track. It is a full fledged documentary. Um, involving interviewing teammates, peers, and everything else. And I think it's utterly amazing. And I think probably of all the stuff that rugby players have done, I would say that's probably head and shoulders above the most kind of outstanding, just because, of, you know, the legwork and, and the, yeah. uh, putting it together and also the nuances of trying to learn and sitting editing and even the, the language, you know, different cuts, different fades, how you do it, and also trying to translate that that image. So fair, fair play to him, because genuinely, I know he said... When, you, when we first met him, you know, people think he's an idiot. I mean, listen, I, I suffer from that more than more than most. Perhaps, perhaps I am an idiot. But um, I wouldn't have said he was ever an idiot, but I wouldn't have said he he was the kind of bloke that had to get up and go to do all that stuff. And I completely and utterly able to put back in my box. I think he's incredibly articulate. Great use of language. Yeah. <laughs> Filibuster's still tickle me. <laughs> um, and I think he's got a real grasp and real grip of where the game is, what needs to happen, and and no doubt, you know, prep to win is going to be amazing and a massive future as well. Yeah, as well. I lo- we, we talk a lot about players making sure that they are ready for when the game finally says that's it, you're, you're done. And I mean, he's he's ahead of the curve by miles. Yeah, c- completely. But also in the fact of his viewpoint is he knows the problems with rugby and he can he can expose those problems and actually, as he said, make a difference. You know, he said, well, everyone says they're going to, you know, yeah, we need to do more. And he's actually doing more because it, yeah, it's it's funny. It's why do we why do we get the best out of a out of an interview with a player because 
your sort of mates. You 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 peel back that shield that automatically goes up on media day. Yeah. You know, it's the same with him doing his documentary. You know, what he said about Marcus Smith, like welcoming back into the house, what he yeah. said um, about the back row in terms of, you know, he suddenly opened up and it wasn't actually Same supposed Chisholm, to be, yeah. yeah, Chisholm, it wasn't supposed to be scripted that way. I actually sat with Chis on Friday at Farnham RFC. Um, oh, did uh, you? Yeah, at Rugby Club. Um, His Sean Dyche comparison is, um, is, is one of the greats. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is very true. Um, I, do, I Yeah, I, I mean, full tip of the cap I think uh, he's incredibly switched on the balance that he has you know he said you know I don't worry about selection mm. I think that's because it's not his, it is his be all and end all but at the same time it's not you know if you don't if he doesn't get picked as long as I feel I've done everything I can to get picked yeah. if I don't I'll go work on this you know, I'll put yeah. everything into that. And I think that sort of balance is what people miss. And, you know, we talk about the mental space of if there is nothing else and everything, there's only one thing that truly yeah. you're fighting and dying for and you're not, and your team binges or whatever, yeah. you know, it, 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 that's what affects you mentally. And that's what gives you dark, dark times. Whereas if you can have that clarity of thought to be able to go, right, I'm here, bang, I've done everything I can, I've ticked every box, uh, I am in great nick for Saturday, sorry you're not playing. Yeah. Fair enough, right, I've got, this was this is my next to-do list that I've got to go, bang, 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 I'll do that. What a great way of thinking about the game. I think that's how, I, that's how I, survived a lot of, I survived a lot of stuff because I used to take things to heart quite a lot but actually the fact that I was able to readjust to things I think made, made, made a big Big difference. I I tell you what I really liked about Benno is that obviously everybody's game has kind of um, you know there's an element of, of race to it. There is obviously the element of um, you know the perceived rugby audience and where you come from and the different journeys. But what I liked is I don't think you know with with prep to win he's not trying to make outlandish statements. He's not no. on a crusade because from what I gathered you know watching the American stuff it is entertainment digestible content that he's going to create and i think f for me that is what rugby wants yes i think there are lots of messages obviously the the other documentary um with no women no try no, no women no yeah. try there is obviously some undertones of that and there are some yeah. things that, that sh she's trying to achieve um but i think it's quite different to have gone right from this space is here but actually what do i want to create you know like a hard knocks documentary yeah. you know like um, america's game that kind of stuff which is what is sort of mass market appeal, but telling good yeah. stories about about kind of the players and the excitement, and the way it's edited, and I, and I think that's really interesting because it's quite easy when you're you're quite young to try to hook onto something, and, and probably he's got more more things to hook on than, than most. So I, I I think that's really interesting. I expect it to be some sort of crusade. Going on. No. It's got um, it's going to be tough though if you <laughs> if you never want to sort of portray someone in a light that's actually truthful. You know, he wants to do the rest yeah. of the game. I mean, it's hard because. You know, if you get that person, and we don't have many in rugby, but no. if you, you know, if he goes into other sports, or whatever, you know, sometimes the truth is the truth. But yeah. I quite like that as well. Like, you know, hard. I think rugby. You know, it's very interesting. He even got to sell it because you know, we. I introduced you to those guys who were very keen to do documentaries with clubs. Yep. Really keen to do it. I had an executive production role on on it in terms of introducing people, and none of these big streaming brands had any interest in it yeah. and England were going to do something with the World Cup and then I think Eddie wasn't that, that interested and then people were like do you know what unless it's a World Cup year rugby just doesn't have the appeal that's what that's what I heard back from four or five streaming people via these other guys who'd done Formula One documentaries they couldn't sell rugby for love nor money yeah. and I think it's actually a massive achievement he obviously must have done a lot of convincing like he said you know he was trying to probably be quite polite about Amazon he had to really educate them that, that some people was going to be interested in the in the club game but I think a hard knock style series where I think even if the personalities were a bit dicky people right. like Ocho Cinco when he you know for the yeah, for yeah, the yeah. Bengals <laughs> yeah. you know or or um you Terrell know Owens the Terrell Owens you know what I mean those <laughs> guys didn't are quite, walk 15 yards. Yeah, I don't walk yeah these are quite quite a taste but I think I don't think there is anyone like that in rugby because we have a sort of reasonable no dickheads policy Good that you mentioned Hard Knocks. Lovely little segue because um, most rugby fans will know the school of Hard Knocks within rugby union's walls. It is 10 years, 10 years old, old yes. as we speak. It delivers life-changing programmes across the UK. It just changed the lives of thousands and thousands of children and adults using rugby, boxing and strongman courses. It's supported by a curriculum of powerful life lessons. It works with unemployed adults to find sustained employment and with school children at risk of exclusion to help them re-engage with their education. Many happy returns to everybody there from us. There's been some brilliant work done with Will Greenwood and Scott Quinnell over the years, but it's fantastic to hear the School of Hard Knocks is going from strength to strength. 
happy 10 years old. And one other note that we wanted to bring you as well, because we brought you the news, the very, very sad news um, a couple of months ago about a young man called Niall Stringer, who was 17 when he sadly took his own life in February this year. There is going to be a celebration game for him on Sunday the 1st of May at his rugby club, Old Brentwood's RFC. It's a day of remembrance for Niall to raise money for the charity foundation in Niall's name and to promote the need to keep talking, to keep listening and to keep supporting. We've had a little flavour of that throughout this show. Gates open at 10 a, uh, 10.30, two matches. There's a Vets game, followed by Niall's teammates in the Colts taking on a bar bars side drawn, drawn from clubs across Essex. Do have a little look at uh, Brentwood's RFC website if you'd like to know more. Lots of good activity, bars, food stalls, cakes, uh, games and raffles and auctions, etc. looking to raise money for the charity foundation. So please do have a look at that if you would like to know more. That is it from us this week. We are off on tour on Friday, would you believe? If you haven't got your tickets, goodbadrugby.com. We are going to have a lot of fun. We'd love to see you there. If you are coming, uh, look forward to greeting you from... I won't have a velvet rope, but we'll try and get Hasks as close as possible to the people. You know people, you know, people are starting to repeat that back to me. What? Like, wherever I go, people are like, oh, I know, you know, I know I'm not behind the velvet rope, but do you mind you getting an autograph on? I know you hate people approaching you. I've heard it on the pod. I was like, yeah. no, look, I hate Muppets approaching me. Just not being nice is absolutely fine. And I don't mind going above the, you know, over the velvet rope to say hello. I am quite charming. You did put a velvet rope in your tall rider. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. At all know. times, you must and have... And a lot of hand form. sanitizer and try to yeah. Yeah. touch me. Um, look forward to seeing you there if you're coming lots of content to come over the next month or so we have been The Good, The Bad and The Rugby we'll see you next week the show is produced by Shara Kilgallen and D'Angelo The Good, The Bad and The Rugby is a folding pocket production look after yourselves bye for now Hold up. 